Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another Archives Live. I am so pleased to introduce Vince Jr. and Vince Sr. Um, I Except I have the labels reversed, so unfortunately, you guys have definitely gone back in time or forward. Anyway, um, I just want to say a couple of words before I let you guys uh, take the front stage. I first um, met these two after succumbing to some very, very persuasive uh, invitations from Vince Jr. who said, we really love ARP synthesizers. You got to come and see what we're doing. He didn't tell me too much, but he told me enough and uh, so welcoming and warming that I said, okay, I'm going to check this out. And I got on a train and I got picked up by a mysterious car and they took me to a, an undisclosed location and and open up this unassuming sort of warehouse thing. And all of a sudden I was in this magic world of synthesizers and not just synthesizers, but speakers and, 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 um, and uh, all sorts of Marshall stacks and, and an amazing assortment of equipment and instruments, which almost illustrates the entire history of rock and roll as far as I can see. So um, they were wonderful to me and uh, we got to hang out a lot more uh, with Michelle Moog and Lisa Belladonna and all the gang down in Asheville a few months later from Moog Mentum, which was a fantastic event. Um, and I even ate oysters in the middle of the mountains, which is something I said I would never do. So um, anyway, I don't want to blab too long. I really want to give you guys um, the, the front stage. So let me just uh, slip into my little bubble. Here I go. Um, and I uh, want to get right into asking um, about your backgrounds. And I admit I know somewhat ab about them, but not as much as I would like and certainly want to share this with the audience. So um, I'm going to start with you, Vince Sr. Um, I was really interested in your musical background. How did you get to this place where you have a, a large area full of beautiful keyboards? I actually still have some of the original things that I had back in the early 70s. It's pretty incredible. Um, I've always, ever since I was in eighth grade, had been in some sort of a band uh, all through high school, all through college. And I get to, you get to a point when you're in college that you, you got to make some decisions. This is like 1979. And this horrible thing came along called disco. And it just ruined my music career because I wasn't going to go play play that funky music, White Boy, and all these other crazy songs, all this disco stuff, which is the only way you could get a job. So we wound up, you know, having to bag the ZZ Top and the Led Zeppelin and all the other classic rock now. And I sold all my gear except for a few cherished pieces. And I bought a washer and dryer and I got married. And <laughs> that's, you know, that was the end of my music career. Career. I went off to college and finished college and started in a, a food, a family food business. You know, that's kind of my my whole music, uh, you know. Uh, and, what, uh, what instruments did you have uh, back, well, back then? Back then, a Honer clavinet B6, a mini Moog. You know, and it was really David Vancouver, who was the Moog salesman. He goes, you, "Some high school kid, you had a mini Moog, you just couldn't believe." Go for it. Now I'm so I'm a waiter, so with all the money I made from tips, I go out and you know buy gear. <laughs> I bet there's just a couple of people out here that know exactly where you're, there you're coming from. So that's kind of what, what my, but I always loved that mini mode. I always loved that clavinet, that Fender Rhodes, and, and uh, you know, it's just, when it was all gone, I missed it. I didn't touch music then until probably the late 90s. I didn't even think about it. You know, I was so busy with the food business. I didn't have time to worry about it. So I went out in 96 and I bought a Steinway uh, L, uh, 80 grand. And then right after that, I bought a, an Alesis QX uh, 8.1. And a Hammond B3. And a I bought a Hammond, uh, Hammond B3 in like 1997. Nice. So when they were still really easy to find and really good ones. So that was it in 97. And then I just didn't do anything for the next 10 years again, eight years. So how did how did the influence come to you, Junior? Um, there, there must have, something must have rubbed off, or this can not be a coincidence unless it's genetic. Well, it's um, it's all through him. The, the, we we both like the same kind of music. Seventies, 
progressive rock, jazz fusion, um, um, with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Yes, Genesis, um, Pink Floyd, Zeppelin, all, all these bands. I was um, kind of, um, uh, let's just say I, I marched to the beat of a different drummer when it came to music when, you know, compared to some of the other kids I went to school with, uh, I was a bit of a dinosaur, always. <laughs> I, I remember the first rock and roll song I, I, I turned him on to when I was a little lad, and it was Tom Sawyer. <laughs> and then it was Cream Brave Ulysses. The song by oh, Peter. wow. Okay. Tales of Brave Ulysses. They were the first two songs I uh, I indoctrinated him with. Yeah, I remember you bought me a Rush CD and said, go listen to these guys. And that was it. He was off. Gone. <laughs> well, that sounds great. And so he the, I, couldn't, I didn't understand. The Judas Priest and the Iron Maiden and all the, yeah, the, the Metallica and, yeah. and the, the Systems of Down and all these guys. I had no idea who they were. But. So you guys sort of exposed each other to new music and old music. And I learned to appreciate all that stuff. I love it. Wow. Um, so let's fast forward to when you started this organization. If you could tell me, I actually don't know when it started exactly, um, but I know that you're a fairly new, uh, like us, a fairly new 501c3. So tell us about the metamorphosis from just getting your Hammond organ and, and the Steinway to to where you are now. Okay, well, around 2000, 2006, Six. 2007, when the stock market and everything got screwed up with the crash and everything, I decided that my 401k had a lot of money in it and it was all of a sudden it was gone. And I decided that was never going to happen again. And I bought a mini boat, oh, I don't know, probably in 2001, 2000, for, about, um, for about 1200 bucks. I think this might have been about 2006, my, yeah. my freshman year of, yeah. of high school. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I saw mini boats for 1800 bucks and they were $2,200. So I figured I had this genius idea. I'd start collecting gear instead of putting my money in my 401k. And I did that for, you know, 12, 13 years. And I amassed a collection. Well, then the word was getting around that we had some very special pieces in what we were doing. And there was a gentleman up in Canada named Dave King. He had a foundation called the Oddities Foundation. Oh, yes. Oh, Dave yes. Had, uh, he had the prototype mini mugs. A, B, C, and D. Yeah. So, so Dave was looking to shut down Oddities or wind it down. And when you have a 501c3, you have to move the items to an organization like Claws. Mm -hmm. So he said, he's the guy who told me, hey, why don't you start a, a, a nonprofit and uh, we'll transfer these, you know, uh, prototypes to you uh, and and so i wish it was my idea but it wasn't my idea it was actually dave's dave's idea to start the you know start the whole thing. when i was in college i was um, um I, I studied business at saint joseph's university in, in philadelphia and uh, i used um this place our collection as material for um different um uh, projects in different business classes oh. thinking about different ideas about how to and he, he's not being humble and modest, but he won first first fly, pretty fly, first prize in this competition he had for these business modeling things they had. It was kind of a, 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 like a, a, mock, shark. a mock shark tank yeah. event. It was cool. I had a whole audience. Wow. It was good. Um, so that's going back three, four years ago now. That we've had to oh, longer than that. Okay, so I, don't, I lost track. Yeah. But it, anyway, so that's that's how Emmy app um was born. Um, and then I just, I still own the majority of the collection personally, or I actually have it in LLC and we have a, it's on permanent loan uh, to MEAP. Okay. So that's kind of the way that goes as long as MEAP takes care of it and is a good steward, you know, it controls the collection. The only gear that MEAP owns is this, uh, the what, prototypes what, and what's donated. Yeah. And what's donated. We have several things that have been donated over the years. Wow. So um, I know I'm very eager to find out some of the stories behind the uh, what you're sitting in front of. Um, but would you, what do you think about taking a tour first and then we come back here, or however you want to do it? It's your, it's your. Can, I, can I show one thing real fast first, though? What's that? I'm sorry. Can I show something first? Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm so happy and proud of this little baby right it's, here. Um, our latest addition to our art collection before uh, COVID-19 hit us. So. I have this good friend in England. His name is Justin Harrison, and Hank's guitars. A lot of people. Denmark Street guitars. Yeah, no Justin, um, but he's been. I hate to use a pun instrumental, but he's been instrumental in <laughs> the 
uh, shipping things that I found, getting things packed up and, and, and sent to us. And connecting us yeah. to uh, people all over. So we basically used, had several things that were in the locker that belonged to uh, John Lord, including his original RMI and uh, one of his the tape decks that people recorded with. Well, he, this little baby is one of John Lord's original um, Honestly. Honestly. Oh, wow. So it's kind of very special. We had every intention of bringing this to Synflex uh, when it got canceled. So this was going to be, so now you guys get to see it. But that's, oh, uh, wow. That's, uh, that's what I'm, okay, you can do the tour now. I love I love how how instruments have a history though. That's one of the I feel like they're they're living and breathing even if they're not you know uh, sentient uh, you know with flesh and blood. There there's there's a human essence to it after people have used them for a while. So no, hearing the stories about them um, is pretty cool. And um, when we go through the tour, are we going to see the um, the Moog modular that was uh, part of the um, collection at MoMA for the uh, Yep, um, that'll be um, included in the video. Oh, great! All right, great! All right. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do this now, everyone. So we're going to go on a little tour. Um, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did when I saw it. Okay.
Wow. So uh, as I commented on the on the Facebook Live, this is the abbreviated version. I'm reminded, I'll just be quick about this story that uh, when I went to the Louvre for the first time, I was uh, accompanied by someone who had been there many times. And she said, you have to walk quickly, otherwise you will never leave this end of the building to see the other. You will just get caught up. So I, you know, I feel like this is a kind of place you could spend a couple of weeks and really not be able to experience everything in there. So someone said, oh, this is great. Chris, Chris Meyer says it's like the Noah's Ark of synthesizers. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So we're back with uh, the Vinces, as I call them. <laughs> and uh, I just want to thank you for putting that together. It was, it was uh, pretty amazing. What, what did you do the uh, soundtrack with? Uh, that was a, um, a performance I had done on the uh, 2500, 2600 uh, rig literally days before everything broke as far as COVID-19. This was about March 13th, 14th. This is right before everything so hit the fan, so to speak. Ah, okay. So at that time, you would just... Um cutting your teeth a little bit. I, I, I know that um, we had some conversations about this, but I, you know, I want to hear more detail. Um, Vince Sr., I'm very interested in how these, uh, these beauties came into your, into your um, place. And then uh, Vince, um, before we break for questions, I definitely want to hear about how and what it was like to go to uh, the ARP 2500 after coming in from knowing other modulars. So maybe Chris Sr., should we take it away from you? Okay, sure. Uh, so I wish I could say I found this. <laughs> like this and it was some kind of, you know, gem of the past, but it's not quite how it evolved. So we had a 2500, which was in very good working condition that we had bought like several years before a single box. And then for years, I think, Dean, if you recall, we had them stacked on top of each other. Right. Vince used to lovingly call it the ARP uh, 5000 because it was this big, massive, tall uh, ARP setup. Well, I scoured and scoured for years and years trying to find room cabinets. And finally, I, I think it was on eBay, if I'm not mistaken. What it was is I found an eBay link through Facebook. Okay. And it might have been on one of the uh, ARP pages and I forwarded uh, the uh, auction you Yeah, uh, so I bought two empty wing cabinets from, from Europe, I think. On yeah. eBay. But the heart, the heart of the system is the main cabinet <clears throat> is originally the way we got it. It was actually, there was a gentleman named Steve Korchek and he went to a school called UTA, uh, University of Texas uh, Arlington, okay? And he went to school there in 1974 when it was just delivered uh, Texas. Now, Steve Korchak, in I think it was 1998, he's in Keyboard Magazine with his massive Moog uh, stack. If you look through that issue, you'll find him. So Steve chased and remembered this thing for over 20 years from when he was in school. He had used it, and he just always wanted it. And he said in 1994, he finally uh, bugged them. They didn't even know they had it. It was locked away. Yeah, it was locked away in a storage locker that nobody had the key to. It. So he finally got a custodian or somebody to let them in there, and then it took him another three years to get them to put it up for a silent bid. But Steve won. Steve bought this center cabinet. So with, uh, with the dual keyboard. With the dual keyboard, and what's really interesting, it had two wing cabinets, um, which Steve sold, and they wound up in Europe someplace. Now the reason you can probably note those is they all had black tops, which was an option with the arms. Uh -huh. So we kept the main cabinet, but we switched the top from the other one. So from the black all, top to the brown. Right, so all the tops are brown, so it would look aesthetically better. Um, the other thing that's very unusual is the, the stands for the wings. They're the original stands uh, for the original system that was at the UTA, um, which is incredible because I, I spent an hour last night scrolling through uh, Google search pictures. I, Maybe I missed something, but I couldn't locate another one with wing stands. Hmm. Um, so I thought that was pretty. Now, in the, there's a brochure that shows the big system with the wing stands, 
but I couldn't find a live photo of, of any of the wing stands. They probably get, who knows over the years what happened. So we have a, a tech that takes care of our, our gear, and he's actually part of the MEAP team here. His name is Tim Warnack, uh, retrolinear. He came and spent a week here, and we put new power supplies in the in two wing room. cabinets. And, and, and the main And side. the main, did, we did the power supply in the main cabinet and moved everything around and tweaked it all up. And so Tim put this whole, <laughs> this whole thing together for us. And I, I'm very proud of it. I think it's got to be one of the finest uh, systems out there. Um, and Vincent's learned how to use it. So that's, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. And that's basically the story. Wow. Well, uh, we're going to get into this in a lot of depth when we, uh, at the, um, tw uh, 50 years of ARP 2500 celebration uh, a week from Saturday. Uh, but uh, as a preliminary uh, topic of discussion, Vince Jr., I'm very curious what it was like to approach this. Uh, I've heard from other people that have used it for the first time that uh, it's, it's a steep learning curve <laughs> if, you don't know, if you don't have any prior experience with this particular instrument. So, yeah, Luckily, I, I have had experience before I tackled the uh, 25. So we uh, got our first 100 um, know, how many years ago, six, seven, eight years ago. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I just, I feel almost guilty for saying this. I never got around to uh, using it, um, mainly because it hadn't been serviced. Uh, we were unsure of the power supply and just trying to line up a tech at that point was difficult. And, He's very, uh, my father is very sensitive and, and rightfully so about firing up gear that hasn't been serviced because uh, if, if you have a bad power supply, that can fry the works. So eventually uh, we had it serviced and um, this was kind of towards the beginning of the uh, founding of MEAP. So um, a quick little side note, MEAP opened its doors, I believe it was New Year's Day 2018. Sounds right. Sounds about right, right. And uh, I've been noodling with it for a little bit, but not really getting anywhere. And then in the fall of 2018, we had a session uh, booked. Um, um, a Scottish uh, filmmaker named uh, uh, Luke Fowler, I think his name was. Yeah. And um, about a month out, and I had to give myself essentially a crash course in the 2500, and I sweated blood over this thing because up until that point, I had worked with... with um, Mogs and I had worked with um, another one, the, the Roland um, System 700, which are fairly straightforward to use patch cables, obviously, and um, point A, point B, and, and then these confounded matrix switches on the ARP. I, uh, uh, it, it was, that's the learning curve that um, a lot of people speak of because. I didn't know if you had to move them all down to line them up in a row or how to use the patch points on either end. And, oh, I was pulling my hair out. So eventually I found a page out of the original 2500 20, manual that showed a basic patch. It was oscillator, filter, VCA, and you go, you line up this row to this column, and, da, 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 and this is how you get the gate signal and the, tr and the CV from the keyboard down into the oscillator to the envelope. And then once it started piecing that all together, it really started to make sense. Huh. And, it, and uh, little by little, I would get more comfortable with adding more elements, adding external sequencers, uh, um, patching the 25 and 2600 together. Uh, using the sample and hold from the 2600 down to the, some of the other the noise generator to them and just and clocking everything together to have one um, unit and the, 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 the demo that you saw at the beginning was one that I shot a couple weeks back the first time I worked in another instrument which was the Roland CR78 drum machine and I had everything clocking together. And, and this is all, I'm not trained in any way. I'm, this is all self-education. And, uh, and my mad scientist lair here at MEAP, I'm able to um, pull things off the shelf and um, see if I can uh, make them talk to each other. That's the, that's the key is to get them, is to have things talking. And um, it's gratifying to, uh, 
get something working right. Would you give her a little spin for us? Well, let's see. Um, well, let's see if I can. Uh, and over here we have an ARP eight channel mixer, which is um, perfect for this rig. So, let's see if I can get some portamento going here. Questions and answers um, shortly, um, and I'll, I'll I'll lead them off. But I did have an immediate question, and because it's so late in in uh, Europe, I want to. <laughs> I thought I'd let Jonas um, ask this question first. He said uh, it looks very intimidating, and how hard is it to make just a single VCO sound? Do you want to explain a little bit of what what you did? Um, and uh, was that a single VCO? What what was going on here exactly? So. Um there was a, a couple different elements to that. Um, so my main sequencer I was using for that isn't the ARP sequencer that's built in. It's this little keyboard called an Arturia uh, key step. So the, the right wing was supplying that. And that's just um, a CV and gate signal from the um, Arturia, which, um, you know, the gate triggers the uh, envelope and the CV triggers the pitch of the oscillator. So I just... Um, have uh, row one into the two, um, at least into the, you know, both inputs of the uh, oscillator, which is the um, control voltage for the pitch. 
and then I have one trick uh, the gimmick triggering the uh, envelope here on row three. That comes out of the envelope into the uh, the fill tamp, the uh, combination filter of VCA to uh, trigger that. And then I have the output of the two operators wanting to going into the first two channel or the four channel mixer on the filter. And then it goes out to the uh, to the mixer. Huh. And then on the middle section, which is the lead part, the Yeah, similar uh, gate and trigger um, uh, gate uh, row three, um, and the CV comes out of row four, or no, sorry, the CV comes out of row two, which go to the oscillators and the gate and trigger go to the uh, envelopes, and then you just kind of follow the flow. You so you take envelopes out to the um, amplitude input of this combination VCA filter. I have oscillators one, two, three, four, going to the, the four channel mixer on here. And then we have, um, you know, clocking and sample and hold and all that other crazy stuff. And the, the main clock source is the Arturia, which I have routed to all, the, all these different sources. Wow. I could talk all day about this. I know. <laughs> And you're going to get to do that, too. I'll do another plug about uh, next uh, Saturday, a week from Saturday. Um, so um, before we go any further with questions, I do want to uh, hear what your plans are, and then we're going to finish up with um, with questions from the audience. So um, when you formed as a 501c3, I understand the original intent, um, but there is a, a definite move towards... Um, programming um, that I've heard you guys talk about. You did a, for instance, uh, a trial run with a, an artist in residency. Um, tell us about what programs you're hoping to do and what programs you are doing now, if, if any. I know we're all kind of held up in, in limbo. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll just talk about where we're going forward instead of um, talking about where things work. It's, it's really, un it, it's changing for everybody. Right. So we're um, I'll, I'll let you. The, the second E in ME app is for education. Mm -hmm. and the last six months, we've been really concentrating on that educational piece uh, so that when the dust clears with COVID, we'll be positioned much better uh, for a couple of projects that we're really, really working on that are going to be very, very interesting. And I can't really talk about it too much because it's, uh, it's something that's going to help us bring some cash in. Um, we actually put up a separate C corporation within inside of MEAP because our good friends uh, at Newman's Dressings got this approved by the government so that nonprofits are now allowed to own for-profit corporations. So we actually have a, a, a for-profit corporation called Strategic Charitable Alliance and SCA, yeah. SCA which is going to actually... Just the most generic name we could come up with. But, well, Strategic uh, Charitable yeah. Alliance, right? Now, in this, any profit has to go to the home. So it's not like, you know, when they set up this new law, uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff for nonprofits. And you, you might want to, you know, anybody, it's like kind of brand new. Uh, we'll definitely need to be looking into that because this is a... We have a couple products that we're working on for education that are going to be like unbelievable. And uh, so uh, it's not like Trump now, unbelievable. No, no, it's unbelievable. don't, don't, don't anyway, go so, there. Um, yeah, huge. Um, it, it's going to be exciting. So we've been really focused on the educational piece. Now, in, I know we don't talk about the past, but we have a really like Eugene is on our Eugene Liu is on our um, board, and he's faculty at, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And so he's been in, instrumental. Here we go again. He's been instrumental with us developing these these educational products, and and also. Um, we did demos down there. We did little concerts down there. We broke, yeah. we, we broke the stuff out. I mean, yeah. we're not afraid to bring the real stuff. People are just like, we did something with the 2600. 20, yeah, some of the Euro rack people kind of turned their nose up. Yeah, and but you and know said, what? oh, look at these old dinosaurs. And you know what? We turned a couple of heads, and, and the Sonic, the Sonic ones, the old ones, are, I, I can tell the difference. Um, maybe not everybody can tell the difference, but I can certainly hear the difference between yeah. a real ARP and a 
a fart. A fart. <laughs> oh, and that's that. That's a whole nother conversation. We are um, all right. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing seeing these prom these projects come to fruition and. Uh, I'm very excited to be working with you all next week uh, at the symposium for the 2500. We're going to have the link available tonight, everyone. Um, so, uh, and we just got a sponsorship, uh, which is great because that means that um, uh, we're not going to require a donation for entry. So, uh, we're really happy about that. Um, uh, we will be offering some t-shirts though if you do uh commemorative t-shirts if you do uh anyway enough of my plug um i'll have lots of time to plug later um however we do have some questions uh coming in and i'd like to um absolutely let people uh interact a little bit so i'm gonna put uh first chris um chris meyer um who's been really helpful for our organization and I want to thank him publicly. Thank you. Um, he has a question for the Vinces. If I heard correctly, you bought the wing cabinets empty. If so, where did you find the modules to fill them with? Good question. So, Do they have any more? <laughs> so, um, all the modules that you see in our is, is, is everything that we that we have. So what we did is we had two main cabinets, and uh, the first time Dina visited us, and actually the photo in the in the uh, archive post shows two stacked atop each other. So what we did is we stripped, totally stripped one of the cabs and, and I hate to use the word cannibalize, but uh, that's what we used to fill the two empty wings. Oh, okay, all right. And we had on, in, in storage, we have shrink wrapped the carcass of the main 2500 cabinet. With a black top on it now. Because With a black switched, top, yeah. We switched the tops. You know, everything has to match and everything has to be color coordinated. There can be a whole book on how 2500s have been retrofitted over the years yeah, or sure. ruined. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Renzo, hello, my friend. Sonido Sintetico. Uh, it's being said that the crosstalk in the matrix panel, matrix patch panel of the 2500 is an issue. Is that true? Absolutely. Actually, I can, I can hear it right now. I can hear it. I can just hear things kind of buzzing away quietly, but it, it, um, the arts are, uh, they do have a noise um, factor about them, but um, they're, um, they're the spirit sonic, in la machina, as we they're sonic killing machines, uh, just, that's not putting it lightly either. Um, one I guess one little side note, I think the first time I ever heard an ARP 2500, and I didn't realize it was an ARP 2500 at the time, uh, was um, Elton John. Um, yes. Our friend Love Lies Bleeding. And I just remember, and that was one of my favorite, another thing that my dad turned me on to, all this great stuff. And that's the first track on my favorite Elton John song, my favorite Elton John album. It's got this amazing polyphonic synthesizer intro i was like what is that and then later on i get you know i started knowing about this stuff and then i realized that that the way that they did that was they layered note by note the way um, that when the carla would have done it you know one note at a time to create a polyphonic patch and that's good that's one of my all-time favorite synthesizer recordings it's is, huge. is elton john's uh show for and that was uh, uh dave henschel, dave uh, henschel I believe, yeah yeah and he worked with jeff and a lot of other people. It actually took me years to realize that this album I loved at home had that amazing sound by my father's instrument. When I found out, I was blown away. And, you know, that's happened a lot with... Uh, so when you pulled out John Lord's um, Odyssey, uh, again, I grew up not even realizing that Deep Purple, which was one of my favorite bands, uh, and it wasn't retro when I liked them. Uh, <laughs> Um, I couldn't believe, like, oh my God, he played it on a scene. You know? So uh, it, it's 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 very cool when you sort of find out uh, in retrospect as well. Yeah, just on a side note, real quick, like Tony Banks, right? The little, very expressive soloist, the pro soloist. Pro soloist. Yeah. It's an incredible instrument. Tony Banks made that thing sing. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and the uh, and, and the Arquadra. And the, and the, I mean, and, these and are the twenty six hundred. These are incredible, incredible instruments. Now. They weren't the best built in the world, 
because like who would hang keys over like <laughs> I know that's a common you, complaint you, about the you bump this thing, you point. snap your keys off, but that's what it sounds, I mean Tough to beat. Yeah, it's but, lush. It's yeah, lush. Yeah. I like. I like the. I like the. Um, the quadra and the omni for the lushness. The there's this fullness that is really delicious. Oh, we have a great question here. Um, uh, so Jonas asks, what is the main difference in sound between the twenty five hundred and the twenty six hundred? Great, great question, my friend. That's um. That's tough to nail down. The, the, the 2500 is obviously a lot more flexible than the 2600, but um, the sound. What's the sound? It's that's a that's a tough one to that's a tough one to answer. Um, I think they um, sonically, as far as the oscillators go, they sound very similar. Um, that's a tough. They're very similar. It's just. Um, I don't know how to answer that. It's just, um, <laughs> and um, I've only, I should say about um, the collection of the modulars we have behind us, everything in, um, in this rig is Tonus era ARP, um, um, both these uh, 2500, or both 2600s are Tonus, and every module except for the power supplies are all Tonus era. Mm, okay. And, um, I should say the the twenty six hundred on the left actually used to belong to Jack Bruce. After Cream had broken up, he formed the Jack Bruce band. And um, Justin and I got a friend Justin. Justin found it along with Jack Ultron and, and a mini Moog. And a mini Moog. Jackson. Wow. I, I feel bad. I don't have really much of an answer for uh, the 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 similarities and differences between the twenty five and the twenty six hundred. I just. I feel that they blend together so well. We we have a gentleman on on our team. His, his name's Ben Luce, Doctor Ben Luce, who worked for Moog back. In his the, father was uh, David, David Luce. Luce, and so Ben loves projects like putting these things on scopes and figuring out what the different waveforms and the density of the thing. So I'll have to run someday that. we'll have Ben. We'll put him put the scope on and put some science to it. We'll do an AB. And of, we, we can, that's a great idea. Take a look at that. so we can. Table. So whoever is interested in. Um, and that uh, we we'll, can can await for those results whenever whenever we have a chance to get to them. All right, next question. Yep. Okay, um, any more questions? So open to the audience. There's a lot of people watching. This is great. So um, I'm gonna okay. So I'm gonna lead with a question right now. Um, tell us the story about the. Uh, Museum um, of Modern Art. The uh, how did you? Uh, I saw a picture of you with Jimmy Page. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so that was actually the the Met. Oh, the and, Met. Right. I'm sorry. Yep. So uh, what that was, um, the Met in um, association with the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame put on a uh, what was it six months a six month exhibit. Play it loud. I think it was called. Yep. Yeah. And um, uh, they approached us, um, um, Jason Dobney, I think his name was, to loan them um, uh, a big portion of the collection that we have here at MEAP is instruments with provenance of different artists. And probably the most prominent keyboard player that we represent here is Keith Emerson. And we, um, in our collection, we, um, we own Keith Emerson's Moog Modular. Um, his Hammond C3, his Hammond L100. Mm. And recently, uh, we uh, received shipment of a, a 1904 Steinway grand piano, among uh, other keyboards. So they approached us about putting Keith Emerson's Moog and two Hammond organs on display up at the, at the Met for six months. I believe it was uh, 2019. I think they did that. It was 2019. Yeah, Michelle and I went. And and they had Depeche Mode's triple ARP 2600 right next to. Case, case mode. Yeah, it was very cool. So we got invited to the opening, the uh, reopening. That was the night Jimmy Page was there. And, everybody and, and you could walk right up to him oh, and struck yeah. a conversation. And he, and he, started, really nice. he started telling me stories about Keith Emerson. We met, uh, met a lot of cool people. Yeah, I met Jimmy Page, uh, Kate Pearson from the B-52s, um, Steve Miller, um, uh, Don Felder, and a lot of cool people there was great. from the Eagles. Yeah. Great night. Um, all right, so another question about the 2500. 
Does the 2500 have built-in reverb as well? So this um, our unit does not. Um, actually, the panel all the way, all the way to the end over here, it's um, it was a spring reverb. I it think a, but it's it's not an ARP it module. It was a homemade one. Yeah. But there's no spring in it, so it's a it's kind of a doorknob or or, or a doorstop. <laughs> but this uh, does not. But the uh, the 2600s do have a built-in spring reverb. Okay. Yeah, that I know. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know this. I don't know that about the twenty five hundred. Yeah, I don't know if they had a factory uh, a reverb module. Then I know. I know Moak did. Or I think Moak did. Yeah, they did. All right. What do you have to um, behind the quadra? Is it a, is it a possible to? Uh, I don't know if you could pull it out or, or describe what 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 you got over there. Um. Oh, the mixer. Oh, that's a mixer. Okay. That's the that's actually the ARP eight um, uh, performance series mixer that has scratchy pots that need to be cleaned. <laughs> yeah, they, that is kind of dirty, but uh, we, we figured just, we figured we wanted to use it because it all ARP it, it, it fit. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great room. Threw it into threw it in the, against my uh, my better judgment. We threw it into service, but that's okay. <laughs> it's a great room. It's a beautiful oh, room. And spray the pots. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're getting close to wrapping up. Um, are there any things you'd like to say about um, that you would like to say that we haven't covered? Yeah, please donate to any app. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say COVID-19 is really, really... It's really not it, just for a loop. Yeah. I mean, I've been literally um, the whole time the sole donor. And recently, we've done a couple uh, things. We've gotten some funds from folks. They were mild, mildly successful. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we've gotten you know, several thousand dollars in donations the last six months during COVID. Which, which we would greatly appreciate and, and thank everybody. But at this point, we're being staffed totally by volunteers. Um, there's no, we had to shut down payroll and shut down, you know, full time. And I'm still hoping and praying that by the end of the year, we can get things going again. But, you know. I am all too familiar with that dilemma, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're uh, not where we thought we would be at this time. Um, but I guess... Uh, we're, lu we're lucky that we're here and having this conversation and that we're able to make music together, which I think is, is where we got to focus. It's going to get better. Yeah. And you know what? We, we're still taking advantage of some opportunities that we only get once in a lifetime shots at. So, uh, you know, I can't, you can't ignore certain artists and certain things that come up to be available because a year from now, you kick yourself in the backside you know, for not taking a chance. Of course. So, of course. Actually, if you got a second, we actually got uh, <laughs> our buddy in England, the guy who got the Rick Wakeman. Oh, actually, right. yeah. we just made a deal with Rick Wakeman to get his C3, his, uh, the organ that did roundabout. I mean, he basically, Justin worked a deal with him, and it's sitting over at Justin's, uh, you know, in England, and that's coming to Emmy app. I mean, what a, what a keyboard. Wow. The, the roundabout, the close to you know, the fragile I mean, it's just, it's just, it, there's certain opportunities like that. You got to do whatever you got to do. You know what I'm even, saying? Even when there's a tight budget. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We've been uh, getting some uh, donations in kind, which is, is really, really helpful. In, in, and, and, uh, and, yeah, we're all in this together to, to, I know this is kind of a corny quote, but I think it's true. No. And yeah. We, have to, we are, true. you know. That's why I love I love working uh, with other organizations like you all, and I'm really really want to thank you for this opportunity. And um, so I'm going to close. I just want to say that um, MEAP has uh, is helping me create some content for the 2500 symposium uh, next week, and they've been wonderful in helping me get images and and share some of their resources. So I, I really want to thank you for uh, for being in our lives. Um, the foundation is really grateful, and uh, you know, I I love this kind of program where we can, you know, chat and and ask questions and learn more about what we are all doing. So thank you again for your time. Um, all right, so uh, this will be posted on YouTube with links to MEAP. It is MEAP uh, dot org, electronic music. Education and Preservation Project, Vince Papillo Jr. and Sr., thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. Thank All you for right. having us on. All right. Take care, everybody.
Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.